This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri, Los Angeles, California, August 2006. Beowulf. Translated by Francis Barton Gumer. Section 8. "'Twas now, men say, in his sovereign's need that the earl made known his noble strain, craft and keenness and courage enduring. Heedless of harm, though his hand was burned, hardy-hearted, he helped his kinsmen. A little lower the loathsome beast he smote with his sword, his steel drove in bright and burnished, that blaze began to lose and lessen. At last the king wielded his wits again, war-knife drew, a biting blade by his breastplate hanging, and the wetter's helm smoked that warm asunder, felled the foe, flung forth its life. So had they killed it, kinsmen both, aethelings twain, thus an earl should be in danger's day. Of deeds of valour this conqueror's hour of the king was last, of his work in the world. The wound began which that dragon of earth had erst inflicted to swell and smart, and soon he found in his breast was boiling, baleful and deep, pain of poison. The prince walked on, wise in his thought, to the wall of rock, then sat, and stared at the structure of giants where arch of stone and steadfast column upheld for ever that hall in earth. Yet here must the hand of the henchman peerless lave with water his winsome lord, the king and conqueror covered with blood, with struggle spent, and unspan his helmet. Beowulf spake in spite of his hurt, his mortal wound. Full well he knew his portion now was past and gone of earthly bliss, and all had fled of his file of days, and death was near. I would fain bestow on son of mine this gear of war, were given me now that any heir should after me come of my proper blood. This people I ruled fifty winters. No folk-king was there, none at all, of the neighbouring clans, who war would wage me with warriors' friends, and threaten me with horrors. At home I bided what fate might come, and I cared for mine own. Feuds I sought not, nor falsely swore ever on oath. For all these things, though fatally wounded, fain am I. From the ruler of man no wrath shall seize me, when life from my frame must flee away for killing of kinsmen. Now quickly go and gaze on that hoard neath the hoary rock, Wigliff loved, now the worm lies low, sleeps, heart-sore of his spoil bereaved, and fair in haste, I would fain behold the gorgeous heirlooms, golden store, have joy in the jewels and gems, lay down softlier for sight of this splendid hoard my life and lordship I long have held. I have heard that swiftly the son of Werston, at wish and word of his wounded king, war-sick warrior, woven mail-coat, battle-sark, bore neath the barrow's roof. Then the clansman keen, of conquest proud, passing the seat, saw store of jewels and glistening gold the ground along. By the wall were marvels, and many a vessel in the den of the dragon, the dawn-flyer old, unburnished bowls of bygone men reft of richness, rusty helms of the olden age, and arm-rings many wondrously roven. Such wealth of gold, booty from barrow, can burden with pride each human white, let him hide it who will. His glance, too, fell on a gold-wove banner, high o'er the hoard of handiwork noblest, brilliantly broidered. So bright its gleam, all the earth-floor he easily saw and viewed all these vessels. No vestige now was seen of the serpent. The sword had taken him. Then I heard the hill of its hoard was reft, old work of giants, by one alone. He burdened his bosom with beakers and plate at his own good will, and the ensign took, brightest of beacons. The blade of his lord, its edge was iron, had injured deep one that had guarded the golden hoard many a year, and its murder fires spread hot round the barrow in horror billows at midnight hour, till it met its doom. Hastened the herald, the horde so spurred him his track to retrace. He was troubled by doubt, high-souled hero, if haply he'd find alive where he left him the lord of waiters, weakening fast by the wall of the cave. So he carried the load. His lord and king he found all bleeding, famous chief at the lapse of life. The liegemen again plashed him with water, till point of word broke through the breast hoard. Beowulf spake, sage and sad, as he stared at the gold. For the gold and treasure, to God my thanks, to the wielder of wonders, with words I say, for what I behold to heaven's Lord, for the grace that I give such gifts to my folk, or ever the day of my death be run. Now I've bartered here for booty of treasure the last of my life, 
So look ye well to the needs of my land. No longer I tarry. A barrow bid ye the battle-fand raise for my ashes. T'will shine by the shore of the flood, to folk of mine memorial fair on Throne's headland high uplifted, that ocean wanderers oft may hail Beowulf's barrow, as back from far they drive their keels over the darkling wave. From his neck he unclasped the collar of gold, valorous king, to his vassal gave it with bright gold helmet, breastplate, and ring to the youthful thane, bade him use them in joy. Thou art end and remnant of all our race the Wagmunding name, for word hath swept them, all my line, to the land of doom, earls in their glory, I after them go. This word was the last which the wise old man harboured in heart, ere hot death-waves of balefire he chose. From his bosom fled his soul to seek the saint's reward. It was heavy hap for that hero, young, on his lord beloved to look, and find him lying on earth with life at end, sorrowful sight. But the slayer, too, awful earth-dragon, empty of breath, lay felled in fight, nor fain of its treasure could the writhing monster rule it more. For edges of iron had ended its days, hard and battle-sharp, hammers leaving, and that flyer afar had fallen to the ground, hushed by its hurt, its hoard all near, no longer lusty aloft to whirl at midnight, making its merriment seen, proud of its prizes, prone it sank by the handiwork of the hero-king. Forsooth, among folk but few achieve, though sturdy and strong, as stories tell me, and never so daring in deed of valour the perilous breath of a poison foe to brave, and to rush on the ring-board hall whenever his watch the warden keeps bold in the barrow. Beowulf paid the price of death for that precious hoard, and each of the foes had found the end of this fleeting life. Befell ere long that the laggards in war the wood had left, Troth-breakers, cowards, ten together, fearing before to flourish a spear in the sore distress of their sovereign lord. Now in their shame their shields they carried, armour of fight, where the old man lay, and they gazed on Wiglaf. Wearied he sat at his sovereign's shoulder, shieldsman good, to wake him with water. No wise it availed. Though well he wished it, in world no more could he bury her life for that leader of battles, nor baffle the will of all-wielding God. Doom of the Lord was law or the deeds of every man, as it is to-day. Grim was the answer, easy to get from the youth for those that had yielded to fear. Wiglaf spoke, the son of Weoston, mournful he looked on those men unloved. Who sooth will speak, can say indeed that the ruler who gave you golden rings and the harness of war in which you stand, for he at alebench oftentimes bestowed on hall-folk helm and breastplate, lord to liegemen the likeliest gear which near or far he could find to give, threw away and wasted these weeds of battle on men who failed when the foemen came. Not at all could the king of his comrades-in-arms venture to vaunt, though the victory-wielder, God gave him grace that he got revenge soul with his sword in stress and need. To rescue his life t'was little that I could serve him in struggle, yet shift I made, hopeless it seemed, to help my kinsman. Its strength ever waned when with weapon I struck that fatal foe, and the fire less strongly flowed from its head. Too few the heroes in throw of contest that thronged to our king. Now gift of treasure and girding of sword, joy of the house and home delight shall fail your folk. His freehold land every clansman within your kin shall lose and leave, when lords high-born hear afar of that flight of yours, a fameless deed. Yea, death is better for liegemen all than a life of shame. That battle-toil bade he at Burg to announce, at the fort on the cliff, where full of sorrow all the morning earls had sat, daring shieldsmen, in doubt of twain, would they wail as dead, or welcome home their lord beloved? Little kept back of the tidings new, but told them all the herald that up the headland rode. Now the willing giver to wetter folk in death-bed lies, the lord of gates on the slaughter-bed sleeps by the serpent's deed. And beside him is stretched that slayer of men with knife wounds sick, no sword availed on the awesome thing in any wise to work a wound. There Wiglaf sitteth, Weoston's bairn by Beowulf's side, the living earl by the other dead, and heavy of heart a head watch keeps o'er friend and foe. Now our folk may look for waging of war when once unhidden to Frisian and Frank the fall of the king is spread afar. The strife began when hot on the Hugus Hygelac fell, and fared with his fleet to the Frisian land. Him there the Hetwaras humbled in war, plied with such prowess their power overwhelming, that the bold in battle bowed beneath it and fell in fight. 
To his friends no wise could that earl give treasure, and ever since the Marrowing's favour has failed us wholly, nor aught expect I of peace and faith from Swedish folk, t'was spread afar how Ongenthau reft at Ravenswood hiked and wrestling of hope and life, when the folk of Gates for the first time sought in wanton pride the warlike skilfings. Soon the sage old sire of Otter, ancient and awful, gave answering blow. The sea-king he slew, and his spouse redeemed, his good wife rescued, though robbed of her gold, mother of Otter and Donela. Then he followed his foes, who fled before him, sore beset, and stole their way, bereft of a ruler, to Ravenswood. With his host he besieged there what swords had left, the weary and wounded. Woes he threatened the whole night through to that hard-pressed throng. Some with the morrow his sword should kill, some should go to the gallows-tree for rapture of ravens. But rescue came with dawn of day for those desperate men, when they heard the horn of Hygelac sound, tones of his trumpet. The trusty king had followed their trail with faithful band. The bloody swath of Swedes and gates, and the storm of their strife were seen afar, how folk against folk the fight had wakened. The ancient king, with his atheling band, sought his citadel, sorrowing much. Ongentho Earl went up to his burg. He had tested Hygelac's hardihood, the proud one's prowess, would prove it no longer, defied no more those fighting wanderers, nor hoped from the seamen to save his hoard, his bairn, and his bride. So he bent him again, old, to his earth-walls. Yet after him came with slaughter for Swedes the standards of Hygelac over peaceful plains in pride advancing, till Hrethlings fought in the fenced town. Then Ongentho, with edge of sword, the hoary-bearded, was held at bay, and the folk-king there was forced to suffer Yofer's anger. In ire, at the king, wolf wanriding with weapon struck, and the chieftain's blood for that blow in streams flowed neath his hair. No fear felt he, stout old Skilfing, but straightway repaid in better bargain that bitter stroke, and faced his foe with fell intent. Nor swift enough was the son of Wanrid answer to render the aged chief— too soon on his head the helm was cloven. Blood bedecked he bowed to earth, and fell adown. Not doomed was he yet, and well he waxed, though the wound was sore. Then the hardy Hygelac thane, when his brother fell, with broad brand smote, giant's sword crashing through giant's helm across the shield-wall, sank the king, his folk's old herdsman, fatally hurt. There were many to bind the brother's wounds, and lift him, fast as fate allowed his people to wield the place of war. But Eofer took from Ongenthau, earl from other, the iron breastplate, hard sword hilted, and helmet too, and the hoar-chief's harness to Higelac carried, who took the trappings, and truly promised rich fee mid folk, and fulfilled it so. For that grim strike gave the Gatish lord, Rethel's offspring, when home he came, to Eofer and Wolf a wealth of treasure. Each of them had a hundred thousand in land and linked rings, nor at less price reckoned mid-earth men such mighty deeds, and to Yofer he gave his only daughter, in pledge of grace, the pride of his home. Such is the feud, the foeman's rage, death-hate of men, so I deem it sure that the Swedish folk will seek us home for this fall of their friends, the fighting skilfings, when once they learn that our warrior-leader lifeless lies, who land and hoard ever defended from all his foes, furthered his folk's will, finished his course a hardy hero. Now haste is best that we go to gaze on our gatish lord, and bear the bountiful breaker of rings to the funeral pyre. No fragments merely shall burn with the warrior. Wealth of jewels, gold untold and gained in terror, treasure at last with his life obtained, all of that booty the brands shall take, fire shall eat it. No earl must carry memorial jewel, no maiden fair shall wreathe her neck with noble ring, nay, sad in spirit and shorn of her gold, oft shall she pass o'er paths of exile, now our lord all laughter has laid aside, all mirth and revel. Many a spear, morning cold, shall be clasped amain, lifted aloft, nor shall lilt of harp those warriors wake, but the wan-hued raven, fain o'er the fallen, his feast shall praise, and boast to the eagle how bravely he ate when he and the wolf were wasting the slain. So he told his sorrowful tidings, and little he lied, the loyal man, of word or of work. The warriors rose. Sad, they climbed to the cliff of eagles, went welling with tears the wonder to view. Found on the sand there, stretched at rest, their lifeless lord, who had lavished rings of old upon them. Ending day had dawned on the doughty one. Death had seized in woeful slaughter the waiter's king. There saw they, besides, the strangest being, loathsome lying their leader near, prone on the field. 
The fiery dragon, fearful fiend, with flame was scorched. Reckoned by feet, it was fifty measures in length as it lay. Aloft, ere while, it had reveled by night, and anon came back, seeking its den. Now, in death's sure clutch, it had come to the end of its earth-hall joys. By it there stood the stoops and jars, dishes lay there, and deer-decked swords eaten with rust, as on earth's lap resting, a thousand winters they waited there. For all that heritage huge, that gold of bygone men, was bound by a spell, so the treasure-hall could be touched by none of humankind, save that heaven's king, God himself, might give whom he would, helper of heroes the hoard to open, even such a man as it seemed to him meet. Perilous path it proved, he trod who heinously hid that hall within, wealth under wall. Its watcher had killed one of a few, and the feud was avenged in woeful fashion. Wondrous seems it what manner a man of might and valour oft ends his life, when the earl no longer in mead-hall may live with loving friends. So Beowulf, when that barrow's warden he sought, and the struggle, himself knew not in what wise he should wend from the world at last. For princes potent, who placed the gold with a curse to doomsday, covered it deep, so that marked with sin the man should be, hedged with horrors in hell-bounds fast, racked with plagues who should rob their hoard. Yet no greed for gold but the grace of heaven ever had the king kept in view. Wiglaf spoke, the son of Worston. At the mandate of one, oft warriors many sorrow may suffer, and so must we. The people's shepherd showed not aught of care for our counsel, king beloved. That guardian of gold he should grapple not, urged we, but let him lie where he long had been in his earth's hall, waiting at the end of the world, the hest of heaven. This hoard is ours but grievously gotten, too grim the fate which thither carried our king and lord. I was within there, and all I viewed, the chambered treasure, when chance allowed me, and my path was made in no pleasant wise, under the earth wall. Eager, I seized such heap from the hoard as hands could bear, and hurriedly carried it hither back to my legion lord. Alive he was still, still wielding his wits, the wise old man spake much in his sorrow, and sent you greetings, and bade that ye build, when he breathed no more, on the place of his balefire, a barrow high, memorial mighty. Of men was he worthiest warrior wide earth over, the while he had joy of his jewels and burg. Let us set out in haste now, the second time, to see and search this store of treasure, these wall-hid wonders, the way I show you, where gathered near ye may gaze your fill at broad gold and rings. Let the beer soon made be all in order when out we come, our king and captain to carry thither, man beloved, where long he shall bide safe in the shelter of sovereign God. Then the bairn of Wellston bade command, hardy chief, to heroes many that owned their homesteads, hither to bring firewood from far, or the folk they ruled, for the famed one's funeral. Fire shall devour, and wan flames feed on the fearless warrior who oft stood stout in the iron shower, when sped from string a storm of arrows shot o'er the shield-wall. The shaft held firm, featly feathered, followed the barb. And now the sage young son of Wellston seven chose of the chieftain's thanes, the best he found that band within, and went with these warriors, one of eight, under hostile roof. In hand one bore a lighted torch and led the way. No lots they cast for keeping the hoard when once the warriors saw it in hall, altogether without a guardian, lying there lost. And little they mourned when they had hastily hailed it out, dear-bought treasure. The dragon they cast, the worm, o'er the wall for the wave to take, and surges swallowed that shepherd of gems. Then the woven gold on a wain was laden, countless quite, and the king was born, hoary hero, to Hrone's nest. Then fashioned for him the folk of gates, firm on the earth, a funeral pile, and hung it with helmets and harness of war, and breastplates bright, as the boon he asked. And they laid it amid the mighty chieftain, heroes mourning their master dear. Then on the hill, that hugest of balefires the warriors wakened, wood smoke rose black over blaze, and blent was the roar of flame with weeping. The wind was still, till the fire had broken the frame of bones, hot at the heart. In heavy mood their misery moaned they, their master's death. Wailing her woe, the widow old, her hair upbound for Beowulf's death, sung in her sorrow, and said full oft she dreaded the doleful days to come, death's now and doom of battle and shame. The smoke by the sky was devoured. The folk of the waders fashioned there on the headland a barrow broad and high, by ocean farers descried. In ten days' time their toil had raised it, the battle-brave's beacon. 
Round brands of the pyre a wall they built, the worthiest ever that wit could prompt in their wisest men. They placed in the barrow that precious booty, the rounds and the rings they had reft erewhile, hardy heroes from hoard in cave, trusting the ground with treasure of earls, gold in the earth, wherever it lies useless to men, as of yore it was. Then about that barrow the battle-keen rode, atheling born, a band of twelve, lament to make, to mourn their king, chant their dirge, and their chieftain honour. They praised his earlship, his acts of prowess worthily witnessed, and well it is that men their master-friend mightily laud, heartily love, when hence he goes from life in the body forlorn away. Thus made their mourning the men of Gateland, for their heroes passing his hearth companions, quoth that, of all the kings of earth, of men he was mildest and most beloved, to his kin the kindest, keenest for praise. End of section 8 End of Beowulf Translated by Francis Barton Gomer.